The Obelith Archives, Book One, Blood of the First Men, brought to you by the book's author, Tom Wouters, who was kind enough to let me read a few chapters from his new book, to which you can find a link in the description to if you wish to continue reading. Prologue, A Flame in the Void Are you ready? inquired a faint, shimmering light. Its ethereal glow flickered and shifted, making it challenging to focus on. But its warm golden hue provided some comfort to the eyes. Yes, replied the man standing beside the light. Fair and I have pondered it deeply, and I believe we are prepared, he added, his voice tinged with uncertainty. He wore clothes adorned with vibrant colors, fitting snugly around his tense physique. Paired with the two broad and sharp horns sprouting from his scalp, he presented a perplexing sight. I do not doubt that you and your wife have given this considerable thought, Nathalan, but this is not a decision to be taken lightly, the light responded, now tinged with a hint of impatience. Are you truly ready? Yes, Nathalan exclaimed, his voice now resolute, his confidence fleeting yet overflowing. I shall commence immediately, he murmured, as he reached down to touch the inky black waters surrounding his feet. The water felt cold, a chilling sensation evoking the depths of one's darkest fears. It was the kind of cold that most people today would avoid, even within the safety of their own thoughts. The water felt like death. Nathalan cupped his hands, scooping up the frigid water and raising it towards the light. The water now seemed to carry a subtle warmth, as if mirroring the growing excitement pulsating within Nathalan. With a mischievous smirk, he whispered, Virendra. The radiant light instantaneously made contact with the water, setting it ablaze with a pure golden flame. The abyssal void that enveloped them momentarily came alive with a warmth that surpassed even the comforting fire of a weary traveler's hearth. Lowering the flame back into the dark waters, the light spoke in a tone devoid of emotion. This was the right decision, my friend. As Nathalan submerged the flame, the waves gracefully parted, seemingly embracing the warmth rather than extinguishing it. In the blink of an eye, the golden flame had nurtured a tiny sapling beneath it, which sprouted and thrived drawing sustenance from its radiant glow. Overwhelmed with pride, Nathalan cast his gaze into the surrounding void, a faint undercurrent of fear fleeting through his thoughts before being overshadowed by his overwhelming sense of accomplishment. In that fleeting moment, too brief for Nathalan to notice. The void seemed to gaze back at him. Chapter
Chapter 1 Warmth It was a cold yet radiant night. The group arrived in Viona, a small town nestled beneath one of Aelia's largest mountains. The moon performed its duty, casting a luminous glow upon the town folk bustling around, busily preparing for the upcoming festival. Each year, the people of Viona adorned their houses and trees to pay homage to their legendary guardian of Weiryard and the Zern, believing the latter to still reside in the neighboring forest of Weiryard. The trio swiftly entered an empty-looking local tavern, already aglow with an assortment of peculiarly colored candles that danced in the chilly moonlight. As they stepped inside, the welcoming warmth of the crackling fireplace embraced them more warmly than any reception ever could. The empty tavern contrasted the streets of the town they found themselves in. Only a lonesome barkeep stood in the dimly lit room. Shedding their extra jackets and clothing, one of the group members revealed their heavily armed stature. A tall man possessing broad shoulders encased in what appeared to be a weighty suit of armor. Donning a sword and a hammer at his belt. Everything about him seemed immaculate as he hung his coat on a nearby rack. Amidst his dark, thick, and clearly unwashed hair, two pale blue pointed ears protruded. If you don't mind, I'll have a serving of your local ale, the man rasped his voice betraying fatigue. You're unbelievable, Wavell, exclaimed the woman of the group, her voice tinged with playful teasing. We've been traveling for days, and your first order is an ale. Towering over Wavell himself, she wore robes instead of armor not needing tools and trinkets to exude an intimidating aura. Her size and the horns sprouting from where her eyes should be were sufficient in that regard. Smiling at the human barkeeper, I'll just have some cinnamon tea if you have it. Thank you, she added. We don't often see Charnin around these parts, the barkeeper responded, a slight tremor of fear in his voice. Nevertheless, I'm glad to have you here. Cinnamon tea and an ale coming right up. Gracefully, she nodded in agreement. Her slender and elegant frame gliding from the tavern doorway to an unoccupied table near the fireplace. Her steps were as light as a feather, defying expectations for someone of her towering height. Playfully, she addressed Tobias, the third member of their group. Humans are always taken aback, Whenever they encounter us this far east, don't you think? Tobias, having just entered the tavern and barely crossed the threshold, looked up and smirked. We humans simply aren't accustomed to witnessing individuals without eyes. Can you blame us? 
despite being tall by human standards, he was noticeably the smallest of the trio. Sporting a heavy coat, he nonchalantly took a seat by the fireplace, absent-mindedly fidgeting with his broad black hat. I'll have an ale too, barkeep, he sighed, resting his mud-stained boots on the table. Vin's expression turned visibly appalled at Tobias's impolite gesture. She hissed at him. We're not in one of your Estonian brothels, Tobias. Show some respect. Before Tobias could respond, the barkeeper approached their table. The festival enticed you, I assume, he asked, delivering the drinks to the group. It's still a few days away, you know. People won't start arriving for another day or two. He twitched slightly as Vin immediately reached for her drink. Our mighty Wavel insisted on exploring the ruins of Eston first, she exclaimed mockingly, absent-mindedly sipping her scalding hot tea, too hot for most to handle. The barkeep looked up, his voice a blend of disbelief and confusion. Eston, he repeated, slightly irritated that he couldn't immediately indulge in his ale. Wavell glanced at the barkeep. The barkeep, even shorter than Tobias, appeared old yet lively behind his eyes. I can bring something back from there for the festival, if you'd like. I know how much you folks here enjoy legends, Wavell offered. Well, yes, we do. But it's been ages since anyone set foot in those ruins, sir, the barkeeper protested. Last I heard, it had been thoroughly plundered and left empty. There's nothing there to bring back if you believe the tales. He now took notice of Wavell's pale, almost blue skin. Recognizing him as at least partially Zalion. If you believe the tales, the place is infested with the more vexed, sir, Wavell stated sharply, producing a weighty book wrapped in leather and adorned with copper accents. Stamped on the cover was an image of a sun pierced by a sword. Flipping through numerous pages, teeming with depictions of various forms of life and undead, he halted at a page displaying illustrations of the Morbexed. Morbexed creatures are drawn to sites of ancient power like Eston, Wavell explained calmly. The barkeep recoiled upon seeing the stamp. Are you one of the forge sundered, he exclaimed, a mixture of fear and curiosity in his voice. Wavell nodded slowly, never averting his gaze from the book. The forge sundered is a nomadic group comprising individuals from various races. They crafted their own weapons and armor to combat the abominations of life and death. Wavell had joined this group after leaving his people behind, searching for a better life. Sensing the tension in the air, Tobias swiftly intervened. You'll only be staying for one night, provided you have available rooms, he informed the barkeep still clad in his dirty travel gear. Trying not to stare at Wavell, the barkeep focused his gaze on Tobias. 
Yes, of course. Five urum will cover your food and lodging, sir. He replied with a mixture of relief and trepidation. For an additional urum, I can prepare a travel pack for you in the morning, so you can be on your way. The barkeep added fleetingly. A little steep, aren't we? Tobias mocked, promptly paying the barkeep the required six urum before hissing at Wavell to stop fixating on the poor man. Grinning, Vin chimed in. You probably wish you had had these, huh, Wavell? She pointed jokingly at her horns. No one would notice you staring. Chapter 2 Masked As the group departed from Viona the next morning, Wavell cast one last glance at the statue standing in the center of an increasingly bustling town. The legend of the guardian of Weiryard had captivated him since his mother shared it with him in his hometown of Zinnia. Legends that spoke of the Zern, how they protected and cherished life, how they were even able to defy death. Amidst these legendary stories, the guardian was in the smack middle of them, waving his thundering weapons through enemies of life itself. Wavell's thoughts briefly drifted to the statue of the Zalian queen in Zinnia, Darnaneth, before swiftly shifting to the nearby human city of Meldon, where his father hailed from. I could go there instead, he pondered momentarily. However, the imposing presence of the guardian looming over him reminded Wavell of his purpose and the urgency to reach Aston. The group spent two days traversing the mountainside to reach the temple of Savnar, perched atop a massive mountain. The Savnar had not been sighted for ages. Their last known encounter recorded in the library of Aston, the capital of Aelia. The text spoke of beings forged from sunlight itself, an account many regarded as an exaggeration, particularly by the church. Yet, with the temple now towering above them, radiating an intimidating aura, the group couldn't help but discuss the Sovnar. What do you think happened to the Sofnar, Vin? Tobias inquired, adjusting his backpack, causing his numerous small equipment pieces to clink together. The popular belief is that they ascended to a higher form of existence, where they now reside in eternal bliss. Vin responded with a smile her gaze seemingly fixed upon the temple. And what are your thoughts? Wavell asked, eager to join the conversation. My people believe that they lost hope after the southern tower of Eston collapsed, and I tend to agree, she said. Her determined gaze locking with Wavell's, causing him to stumble over a pebble. Watch your step, Wavell. We need you intact when we arrive, she playfully admonished. The remainder of their two-day journey was filled with brief conversations and light-hearted banter. Wavell offered prayers, seeking both rest and safety for their group. Tobias meticulously sharpened his knives and bolts, 
and paid particular attention to caring for his cherished hat. Meanwhile, Vin spent her spare time meditating and indulging in her passion for painting. The landscape they crossed was largely considered to be safe. Many merchants and even regular townsfolk traveled these roads. Even though the road itself was of poor quality, since it had been made on a twisting mountainside, the hike was fairly peaceful. Finally, they arrived at the awe-inspiring ruins of Eston. The stories had not exaggerated the grandeur of these towering structures. The architecture was unlike anything the trio had ever seen. The northern tower remained intact, its pinnacle shrouded by clouds grazing its sides. However, the southern tower lay in ruins, scattered amidst the grass at its base. Nature had claimed many fragments of the tower as its own. The southern tower had crumbled ages ago. Vin knew from her studies that it was at this site the Guardian once battled a great evil. With a deafening sound of thunder and stone, the Guardian vanished as the tower plummeted from the sky. Tobias, on the other hand, had heard a great deal of stories about the fabled fire-haired woman who resided in a room of eternal warmth at its base. If he was being entirely honest, he wouldn't mind catching a glimpse of her for himself. The two towers stood, divided by a wild river that flowed into a lake. The lake possessed a deep blue hue, with a water vortex swirling at its center. Legend spoke of two fish caught in an eternal dance within the vortex, an endless race causing the swirling waters. However, this was not the reason the group had ventured to this place. They aimed to reach the pinnacle of the intact northern tower. Sword in hand, Wavell pushed open the withered wooden door of the tower. Vin, you warn us if anything gets too close. I can't see my own hand in this darkness, Wavell said in a bossy tone. I'll see them before they see us, Vin reassured, holding her staff at the ready. What do you mean, they? Tobias asked, fear creeping into his voice. Both Wavell and Finn looked at him with disbelief. You haven't prepared at all, have you? Vin exclaimed. She rummaged through Wavell's backpack and pulled out a heavy book from the bottom. We told you to read this, she said angrily thrusting the book into Tobias's hands. Wavell mentioned them just a day ago, you brainless idiot. Opening the book to the page marked with a small orange ribbon, Tobias saw three sketches of humanoid beasts. A shiver ran over his spine, but he managed to hide it. Even in black ink, their faces appeared pale as bone, and their limbs were long and strong. Wisps of smoke seemed to hang over the beasts, but Tobias couldn't determine if it was intentional or smudged ink. At the top of the page, their names stood, Morbexed. 
forgot how much you two enjoy your fairy tales, Tobias said, attempting to sound confident. Undead humans, whose very essence has left them undead and wild, sounds a bit exaggerated, doesn't it? He continued mockingly. I don't doubt that there's something in there. Maybe a troll or a kivare. But by the flame, even a dragon would be more believable than your more vexed. He protested, his doubt evident in his last few words. He laughed. You too believe anything you read. Besides, Vin, can't your magic protect us from these supposedly dangerous undead? Tobias taunted. You must mistake me for Din Onar, the arch ascentum himself, casting down the light of the Sovnar at whim. All three of them flinched at this. Din Onar was a legendary Venerkin arch ascentum, slain in the Charnin Venerkin war long ago. Vin's people killed him, and was now considered a taboo among the Charnin. Vin regained her composure, and retorted in an irritated voice. I bet even Wavel Steel couldn't protect you from your own stupidity, she hissed. Wavel stepped between the two, trying to diffuse the tension. Whatever awaits us in there, more vexed or otherwise, we must proceed with caution, he declared. Murmuring something under her breath, Vin ignited the tip of her staff. For those who need some light, she said confidently, she started climbing the first set of stairs. Tobias quickly looked at Wavell, shrugged before following closely behind Vin. Wavell scanned the area to ensure they weren't being followed before closing the wooden gate and joining the others upstairs. The northern tower of Eston was dark, cold, and damp. Wavell and Tobias noticed the environment affecting Vin the most. The Charnin were unaccustomed to the cold, having lived in the desert and gained a reputation as formidable craftsmen. Vin's thick skin provided minimal protection against the harsh environment, as it was meant as protection against physical trauma rather than cold. Her pace gradually slowed with each floor they climbed, and after about twelve floors, she finally had to rest and warm up. With a simple word in her native tongue, Hinoka, Vin ignited some moss growing from the windows of the tower. Casting the spell weakened her further, but she tried her best not to show it. Should you be using magic in your state? Wavell asked, concern evident in his voice. I know you, a centum, can replenish your essence, but we might need it if we were to run into trouble, he continued. Vin shut him down by waving her hand at him, clearly indicating for him to be quiet. The humid environment provided ample fuel for fires. The wetness of the moss initially resisted the flames, but eventually the group managed to create a small fire where they unpacked their travel sack. What kind of barkeep packs apples in a travel sack? Tobias grumbled. 
Doesn't he know they'll spoil? He sliced a large chunk from one apple and skewered it on one of his knives, roasting it over the fire to caramelize it. We... we did say we were heading this way, Vin replied, shivering from the cold. I suppose so, Tobias replied, seemingly oblivious to Finn's cold appearance. The enjoyment of his apples turned out to be a far greater distraction. Wavell, enjoying the warmth of the fire, took off his coat and draped it over Vin. He gazed at the sparks shooting upwards and drying in the cold as they descended. The wet moss provided plenty of sparks to captivate his attention. After a while, Wavell gestured to Tobias. Hand me one of those apples, Will. His sentence was abruptly cut off by a screech so loud that it echoed downwards four more times. The group froze, their stillness making them appear like statues. Panic filled their eyes as they looked at each other. Dragons? Don't tell me it's those nasty Kivare. Not those. Oh, by the flame, not those. Tobias panicked in his thoughts. Regaining control of his body, Wavell swiftly stood up, grabbing his sword and hammer from his belt. He scanned the stairways. Nothing. Vin slowly rose, shivering slightly. It was unclear whether it was due to the cold or fear. Yakali, she screamed. The room filled with a bright light, its source impossible to discern. She felt dizzy. Vin heard it before the others did. The slow pounding of footsteps. Too light to be human, yet too heavy to be vermin. Gradually, the figure descending the stairs entered Vin's light, moving with a certain grace. The shape was smaller than a human, but held a mask as big as a human face. It had gray, wrinkled skin and hair flowing down to the ground, trailing several feet on the floor. Recognizing the figure as a masculine, Wavell swiftly lunged forward, delivering a precise strike with his sword to the creature's small torso and landing his hammer on top of the mask, shattering it in place. At the same time, two small bolts, not much bigger than a feather, flew right next to Wavell, piercing the masculine exactly in the right lung. One of the bolts appeared to be burning at the tip. The creature stumbled back, and as it fell backwards into the stairway, the group caught a glimpse of it before it abruptly stopped after tumbling down several floors. Only the shattered mask and hair remained near Wavell's feet. All that fuss for a little masculine, Tobias proclaimed, having drawn his two handheld crossbows. I thought we might actually have had to fight a dragon, he sighed. Look around you. Those wouldn't even fit into this room, Wavell protested, without taking his eyes off the masculine shattered mask. The mask was white as bone with red paint on it, adorned with various patterns that Wavell didn't recognize. The hair, however, was made of damp moss growing inside the tower. I thought these were only found on Sestra, 
Wavell said, hoping for an answer. See, seems they took a liking to this place, Vin said, shivering. Little Masklins just wanted a place better than that damned island. Wouldn't you, Wavell? Tobias said, while stowing his crossbows away, reloading them before briefly checking their metal parts to ensure they remained polished. I suppose so. I never understood the whole mask thing, though. Is it true that if you look into the mask's eyes, they can give you ideas you think are your own? Wavell asked Finn. First I've heard of it, she replied, clearly not interested in entertaining the conversation any longer. Well, even though it's far from home, expect more. A lone mask is seldom the case, Wavell said, as he began gathering the mask pieces and hair. He threw them into the fire, creating a new array of sparks, much to his liking. Slowly, the group continued their ascent up the tower, with the air growing thinner with each step. The sounds of what they assumed was a masculine colony filled the seemingly endless stairway. The cold of the tower continued to pierce their muscles, as sharp as glass. Vin was particularly affected and started lagging behind Tobias and Wavell. Every movement she made was met with an icy grip that she couldn't shake off. Eventually, they reached a set of windows that weren't overgrown with moss like the rest of the tower, allowing sunlight to fill the room. Wavell quickly walked over to assess their height. All I see is clouds. That's a relief, I suppose, he said, his tone devoid of excitement. Despite the growing sounds of the colony above them, Tobias waited for Vin to reach the same level where Wavell and he were waiting. Sounds like they're having fun, at least, he remarked, pointing upwards. I wonder if they're expecting some unexpected guests, Tobias smirked, rubbing his hands together. How can you expect unexpected guests? Finn asked, her usual smirk absent when Tobias made a foolish remark. Lousy attempt at a joke, Tobias whispered, a hint of shame creeping around his lips. Pulling out his two handheld crossbows, he cleared his throat. Wavel. Do you mind taking the lead on this one? I'm not in the mood to entertain any funny ideas today. Luckily, you need the ability to think before they can influence you, Tobias, Wavell replied, jokingly, as he readied his sword and hammer. Vin simply raised her staff without uttering a word. She was nervous. Stepping forward, Wavell ascended the stairway. The smell of freshly grilled meat filled his nostrils, accompanied by the intense aroma of caramelized or perhaps burnt fat. His mouth watered slightly as the scent engulfed the entire floor. They're right above us, he whispered, faintly looking back, pointing his hammer towards the next set of stairs. Tobias was the first to spot it, squeezing himself between the walls of the stairway and Wavell, 
he walked along the floor right below where the masculines were feasting. Well, well, now what is this nifty thing? He whispered absent-mindedly to himself as he laid his hands on a strange piece of equipment that extended partially inside and outside the tower window. The equipment looked peculiar. It had the handle of a standard crossbow, but the flight groove and foregrip were considerably larger. The string was twice as thick, and the limbs of the crossbow stretched out almost three times as wide beyond the tower. Adjacent to the sight bridge, there was a rope coiler attached to an arrow as big as Tobias's forearm. In disbelief, Tobias peered outside the window, seeing only the tops of clouds. You can't even see the ground from here. Why install such a crossbow if you can't even see who's attacking the tower, he protested. Examining the arrow, he noticed that its tip was stained with dried blood. Do they only have one arrow or something? Maybe that's why it's fixed to this contraption with a rope, he chuckled. Realization struck him as he looked around. They really only have one arrow, don't they? Unamused, Wavell sighed and gestured for Tobias to return to the stairway, briefly checking on Vin's progress. Shivering intensely, Vin managed to smile that wouldn't even deceive a drunkard. With pity in his eyes, Wavell whispered, You smell it too, right? Grilled meat means fire. We'll rest up when we've dealt with them. Vin appeared relieved, gripping her staff a little tighter, summoning all the fleeting confidence of a king arriving at his own banquet, only to realize that half of it been devoured prior to his arrival. Tobias slouched over, finally taking up his position behind Wavell, nodding affirmatively to indicate his readiness. Wavell stormed up the last set of stairs, his armor clattering with the sound of a hundred blades colliding. With the precision of a seasoned fighter, he launched himself at the first masculine he spotted, striking down with his hammer as if he were molding the burning steel of the sundered itself. The force shattered the mask and propelled the masculine carrying it backwards, eliciting a scream of both pain and fear. Quickly regaining his stance, Wavell prepared to strike the maskless masculine when he found himself sheathing his sword once more. Bending down, he collected the pieces of the broken mask and carefully placed them on a nearby table, narrowly avoiding it during his leap. Ammo tale dea screamed the masculine at the head of the table, waving his hair made of dried moss. Only now did Wavell observe the room in its entirety. Four masculines sitting around a small table made of decaying wood. A freshly grilled bird lay on the table, its side bearing a gaping wound. The creature's feathers were falling off or burned into the skin, and the masculines were preparing to feast. Feeling relatively ashamed, Wavell gathered the remaining mask pieces and tried to return them to the maskless masculine 
whose mask he had broken. Hiding its face, the masculine whispered, Turna Aru Gabal, Iknadar Makler, quickly grabbing the pieces that Wavell held out. Wavell looked towards the largest masculine, stowed away his hammer, and apologized before simply continuing toward the next set of stairs. With disbelief in his eyes, Tobias witnessed this scene. Wavell had the perfect opportunity for an ambush and surprise. Yet he chose to let the masculines enjoy their dinner before walking away. It didn't take long for Tobias to realize that both Vin and he were following closely behind Wavell as they climbed the stairs, leaving the diminishing sounds of the feast behind them. Confused, Tobias looked to Wavell. What just happened? he asked. I'm not sure. I just... I didn't want to attack them anymore, Wavell replied. You... you mean they didn't want you to attack them anymore? Vin interjected with a shivering voice. Seems like I can think after all, Tobias added. Vin and Wavell both sighed in defeat as they continued their journey up the seemingly endless stairs. Chapter 3 Above it all. The thinning air made it difficult for the group to breathe. But Vin, being accustomed to the fiery high peaks of mountain tops, was less concerned about it than the increasing cold that gripped her body like a constricting snake. Tobias, on the other hand, struggled the most with the thin air. While humans are adaptable, they often struggle to keep up with races that are more specialized in extreme conditions. Gasping for air and puffing with each step, Tobias adjusted his hat as if using it to pull himself up. Thankfully, their progress was halted by a large archway that spanned two floors. It appears we've reached our destination, Wavell calmly remarked, his attention drawn to three masks lying at the entrance of the archway. They just left them here? Tobias questioned hastily, attempting to catch his breath. He absent-mindedly pushed the masks around with his damp traveling boots, which were still wet from the moss. As he moved the masks aside, he noticed that the mossy hair was concealing cracks along the tower floor. Tobias glanced back at the masks with a worried expression and picked one up, removing the hair and placing it in his backpack. Observing the cracks on the floor, Wavell looked out the window and saw the sea of clouds, which lay at least ten or twelve floors below them. We've reached the top, he concluded. And no more vexed, Tobias exclaimed, the note of mock sarcasm in his voice. His strained voice continued, I told you they wouldn't be here. With a tired expression, Vin entered the archway, holding her staff more for balance than as a weapon. The group made their way through the archway, stepping over the cracks on the floor, and soon came across three lifeless, maskless figures lying on the ground. Their essence and vitality seemed drained, 
as if their blood had been sucked away, resembling a withered plum left out in the suns for days. The room had a tall ceiling that ended in a gable-like roof. The room was devoid of windows and torches, casting it into darkness. Tobias went back to the previous room and quickly fashioned makeshift torches using the hair he had pushed aside. He secured them in the gaps of the stone wall and ignited them with sparks. With a proud expression, he looked at Vin and said, No magic needed. Vin gratefully made her way towards one of the fires, warming herself and expressing her thanks with a sigh. She glanced at Tobias with gratitude shining all over her face. The dimly lit room revealed paintings on the walls. Three paintings, each depicted a child and adorned three stone segments, each surrounded by its own arch. At the feet of each segment lay a lifeless, maskless figure. The first segment on the left, closest to Tobias, depicted a young boy with light brown skin and golden hair. He couldn't have been more than twelve years old. It was peculiar to see a boy of his age wearing leather armor, and the landscape behind him held a significance known only to Vin. The second segment in the middle of the room, closest to Wavell, depicted another boy who appeared smaller but older than the first. He had dark black hair that extended past his pale white pointy ears. He wore a white shirt with a nod at the top and patchy brown trousers, giving him an ordinary appearance similar to any boy you might see walking down the street in a city. Behind him, there was a forest with a solitary cabin and an assortment of stone statues in an assortment of colors. The third and final segment showed a girl who was younger than the black-haired boy, but older than the golden-haired one. Her hair was bright white, contrasting sharply with her pitch-black skin. She had a troubled expression in her eyes, with one eye red and the other gray. She clutched a handheld lyre to her chest and wore clothes suited for a performer. Behind her lay ruins, covered in ash and red dust, while dark mountains stretched as far as the painting allowed. Aiken, Vin softly uttered, realizing she hadn't spoken since after their encounter with the feasting masculines. She continued to gaze at the painting. The poor girl is trapped in the red scourge, she added, her voice laden with sympathy. The Dakin were a race of dark elves from the southeast of Aelia. Their lands were plagued by sickness in the form of a red mist composed of sand and ash after their leader angered a god. That was the common tale, at least. Adapted to their surroundings, the Dakin built a new city proudly named New Orneo referring to forget about the ruins amid the Red Scourge and the creatures that now roamed there. Many Dakin chose to leave after the disaster, seeking refuge in nearby towns and cities, 
where the pity of others helped them along the way. I think this boy is a Loftian, possibly half-human, judging by his hair. Wavell commented, glancing at Vin. The boy bore a resemblance to Wavell himself, with dark black hair, indicating the mixing of elf and human ancestry. However, his skin was not the human white, but rather a pale gray tone, different from the typical Loftian or human complexion. What's a Loftian doing in the forest? Aren't they supposed to live in the mountains? Tobias asked, examining the painting of the boy. Loftians were the most common race in Aelia, second only to humans. They were widely known and appreciated throughout the land. Their hospitality was unmatched but they expected reciprocation. Those who respected this exchange found themselves able to call upon Loftians for assistance. However, those who took their generosity for granted were left out in the cold, shunned outside the capital city of Delon. What the Loftians excelled at was art, their statues were intricately detailed, surpassing any illusions conjured by an ascentum. The portraits were vibrant, rivaling a summer sunrise, and their music was more enchanting than the voice of a newfound lover. He must be living with his family, Wavell replied, a hint of jealousy crossing his usually stoic demeanor. Well, wherever he lives, it seems he brought his statues, Tobias grinned. He continued, pointing at the last and middle segment paintings. I know one is a Dakin, and the other is a Loftian, or should I say, half Loftian, but what is he? Tobias pointed at the segment depicting the golden-haired boy. I've never seen a human with this hair and skin, he remarked, adding quickly, or this height, as if feeling slightly embarrassed. The boy in the painting did indeed appear tall, with proportions different from those of ordinary humans. His limbs were longer and more robust, and his muscles seemed too developed for a boy of his age. One of the golden suns made his hair shine even brighter. I don't know what to make of him either, Wavell calmly said, gently moving the maskless body aside. As he did, he noticed that the hand had been touching the base of the Loftian painting, which slid off with some difficulty. Me neither, Vin replied, not budging from her spot near the fire. Perhaps he belongs to a race that no longer exists. I'm certain I've never seen anything like him, she continued. Seen. Funny. Tobias said mockingly, while imitating horns growing from his eyes. You know what I mean, idiot, Vin retaliated. Wavell gestured for the others to join him, and pointed at the base of the lofty in painting. These maskless were trying to take this, he explained, indicating a tool sticking out. The tool had a well-crafted handle, made of rich violet wood, revealing sundered steel underneath. Golden letters on the side displayed a word that none of them could decipher. 
that's a chisel, Vin exclaimed with excitement. Made from vein wood. Her voice was interrupted by the cold gripping at her, but she pressed on. The markings are Loftian, I assume, she said, gazing up at the painting. Vin quickly returned to the warmth and safety of the fire. Upon hearing this news, Tobias took it upon himself to push the other two maskless bodies aside, revealing what they had been trying to take. Beneath the painting of the Dakin girl, there was a beautifully preserved seedling encased in hardened tree sap, its amber color shining vibrantly in the light of Tobias's fires. Underneath the painting of the golden hair boy, there was an amulet engraved with a sigil of a sun rising from the water. It was exquisitely crafted from silver and, more intriguingly, gold. The bias grinned at the sight of gold, quickly calculating in his head. He realized that the amount of gold in the amulet could be worth to up to ten or even twenty all. more money than he had ever seen, let alone owned. He carefully placed the masculine's hand back, hoping the others wouldn't notice the gold. Just silly trinkets, Tobias declared loudly, attempting to feign disappointment. Wavell stood beside him. His curiosity peaked. What about this one? I can't make sense of the other two, he inquired, trying to catch a glimpse around Tobias. Desperate to keep the amulet hidden, Tobias moved even more to block Wavell's view, and quickly said, It's just a leather arm wristband. Nothing special. Why did you move the maskless back then? Wavell questioned, attempting to sound intimidating. If it's merely a silly trinket, why not show us? He made a gentle shove towards Tobias. In a panic, Tobias pushed Wavell away with all his strength, surprising him. As Wavell stumbled back, he instinctively grabbed the chisel, and his eyes rolled back into his skull. The room began to shake violently, and the sound of stone grinding against stone filled the air. Vin watched in disbelief as the archway at the entrance of the room started to close. Rushing to Wavell's side, she screamed at Tobias, What have you done, you fool? You idiot. Didn't you see the maskless? Oh, gods, Wavell. She tried to remove his helmet, only to find his once blue eyes rolled back, showing only the whites and the blue veins. Dust fell from the ceiling as the door closed and the entire tower shook. Tobias took a final look at Wavell and Vin on the floor. Vin let out a scream. Kazakuru! A faint gust of wind pushed Tobias away from Wavell, and Finn herself fell to the floor, having exhausted too much essence. Tobias had gone too far to stop now. Twitching his traveling glove, he tore a piece from his long coat and wrapped it around his hand. He then reached out and grabbed the amulet, but as he did, his eyes rolled back and he crumpled to the floor. The tower shook one last time with the sound of crumbling stones. The archway closed shut, and the top of the tower broke off. 
Vin felt herself becoming weightless as they began to tumble toward the sea of clouds below. <laughs>